Uh, well, welcome everyone. Um, this late summer meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. This is Monday, Monday August 26th. And as we all know, uh, this meeting is virtual and is being recorded. We um, have a couple items on the agenda, which may take a bit of time, but I wanted to start um, first by asking if there is any public comment. Um, this would be anything anyone would like to comment on that is not related to anything on the agenda. And if you are one of those individuals, um, you could please raise your hand and when you speak, tell us who you are and where you live. And is there anyone there? Okay, we're going to go on. Um, we have a very brief, brief, brief chairs report tonight. Um, uh, just wanted to update everyone on what's going on with the um, abolition and reform national register nomination. You know, I'll know at the last meeting we talked about this. Um, we've been getting some comments back from S historical commission and Michael and um, and I and Sarah kind of um, have been working on this um, completely in line with the open meeting law, uh, just to see what we can do to try to help the process along. Um, this, as you all recall, this uh, project is being conducted through the Ruggles Center that received a CPA grant a couple of years ago to uh, prepare um, a National Register to report National Register of Historic Places nomination for di the district in Florence. Um, the consultants working with them have spent a lot of time doing excellent research on this area and have proposed um, a couple of large districts. Mass Historical is having some difficulty with them. And so we thought it was right for us to step in at this time to help them. Um, Michael has volunteered to uh, kind of take the lead on this. I guess it's okay for me to say that Michael, um, with his expertise and willingness to look at this in depth. So I'm gonna ask him, if you don't mind, Michael, to just kind of update everybody on where we are with it. And um, no decisions to be made, but I just thought all the commissioners should know what's going on. Sure. So, Michael? Yeah, yeah so just very, very briefly, um, Sarah and Martha and I met with um, a couple of folks at Mass Historical Commission, and um, they're the folks that kind of shepherd these applications as they move towards National Historic Register approval, and they have a pretty good idea of what it takes to do that. And they have some concerns about the application as it currently stands, not the research, which they're very impressed by, um, but simply by the fact that when you create a district, there needs to be a critical mass of properties that make it cohere as a whole. And because of the nature of that part of Florence, and because of the nature of the application and also the historical development of that area of Florence, it's a little bit complicated and we're working with them. They're very positive about the application. Um, they think it's going to work in one form or another, um, but they had some suggestions about how we might move forward. At this point, the folks at Ruggles, I think are pretty fatigued with the process. They've been working on this for three years. And that's one of the reasons that we're stepping in here, because I think we can bring some fresh eyes to bear and help uh, move it forward. So over the next couple of months, uh, Martha and uh, Sarah and I are going to be working on this and uh, hopefully get it to the next stage and get everybody sort of singing the same tune. Um, but as Martha was saying, the documentation that's been generated as part of this process is truly impressive. There's a lot of information there. There's a very good rationale for doing the district. So we don't have any doubts that it's going to move forward, but um, we just have to get it to be configured in a way that's going to get it across the finish line, as it were. So if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to respond to those. OK. All right. I'm, I'm wondering, this is Barbara, I'm wondering if that if, because the application hasn't been submitted, but is it available online anywhere or for commission members to look at if they have? 
Um, well, we have received some um, peer, um, interim submittals, I guess I would call them, of um, criteria statements and area forms. Um, I think that we did, uh, Sarah, I'm pretty sure those were circulated as part of our information that came to the commissioners, but it's one of those things that's been, you know, eight months apart, nine yeah, it's months. It's been a while, so I just yeah. thought. Um, it, it is. I can or... send a link to where that lives in our file cabinet. Yeah. Great. I think part of the issue, Barbara, is that um, the historians uh, that are working on this consultants, they um, they de developed a very large uh, sort of area to consider for the nomination. And Mrs. Stroke was having trouble with the size of that and how it all, all as Michael alluded to, all the properties work together. So it's like we're going to have to pare that down and create smaller districts or something like that. And that's what we've got to figure out and help the consultants do that. And as Michael said, they do seem burn, a little burned out, uh, understandable. Uh, but I think we'll get there. Mass Historical is so positive about this, and they really do want to see a nomination coming from us. But we just have to get it right. And so it's time for the commission to really be paying attention. Um, and luckily, we, we are. So that's good. Any other questions? Greg, you have any thoughts? Okay. All right, great. Moving along, uh, we do have a set of minutes. This is from March, uh, earlier March. And um, I don't know if anybody has, everybody's reviewed these. Um, and if so, does anyone have any comments? And if not, um, I take entertain a motion to approve and accept. I would move to approve and accept the minutes. Second. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Um, any discussion? All right, Barbara, we need to, or sorry, Sarah, we need to take a vote. All right, so quick roll call on those. Greg? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Michael? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Unanimous, thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is the request for a local historic district certificate of appropriateness pursuant to one nine, section 195 of the Northampton Code for demolition of an existing accessory structure and construction of a new dwelling unit. Um, this is at 197 Elm Street. It's parcel 31A-039. And uh, we all have seen the application materials. Um, if the applicant is here, and I think I see at least a couple of people, Stacy, yep. Um, if there, if you have a presentation, we would love to see that sort of up front so that everybody has a um, equal understanding of what's going on or what's being proposed. And then the commissioners will ask questions and we'll have our discussion. Um, so. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't do many Zoom meetings, I'll be honest with you. So um, the presentation is pretty pretty straightforward in the application. There's an existing pool Let house. me stop with you. I don't, have, um, I don't have a video or okay. just, that's what you're asking for. Okay. So we have uh, we have drawings, but first of all, Stephen, can you just identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Stephen that's Ross, okay. the owner of Construct Associates, and I'm representing the Novaks who want to do this project. Great. Um, Sarah, can you um, put the drawings up on the site, that, the presentation, the application drawings? That would be great. I can. Uh, can you just OK, question? great. Um, while Sarah is doing that, Stephen, if you want to just kind of give a verbal overview of what's being proposed, and then we can take a look. So there's an existing pool house on the house, on the property, excuse me. Uh, 20 by 20 that we'd like to tear down because it, it's non-conforming at the moment and uh, in poor shape and we're trying to create a structure that basically for lack of a better term it's a um more of a um a he shed for dad to stay in when he comes to visit and and still use it as a pool shed pool house excuse me when he's not there it's a it's a second not a second home it's a place for him to stay when he's in town essentially okay 
and Sarah's going to share her screen here. Um, so if you could just sort of walk us through these, that would be great. Um, I could assert what? If you could just walk us through the drawings to just get orient us. As you can see on this first page here, the, the drawing to the left, it's the existing um, layout of the property with the pool and the pool house is to the back left-hand corner, the 20 by 20 structure that I, I don't know the date of, to be honest with you. Um, I assumed it was moved there with when they put the pool in or constructed when they put the pool in. It's a, it's kind of, uh, it's a shed basically with a cement floor poured inside of it up against the framing. So, um, and currently it has the pool equipment in it and there were, there was some um, rough bathhouse type situation in the structure. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. So this actually shows the relocation of um, the footprint, I guess I would say. Correct. If, as you see in the drawing on the left, currently it would be non-conforming to just convert it as it sits now. That's, that's the, the inside line is the setback, the allowed setbacks in the zoning. And if you look to the drawing to the right, it's, it's turned slightly to the left. So it becomes conforming. And obviously it will be a new structure then. It'll, it'll have um, siding. We haven't yet determined yet whether it will be hardy siding or um, collapse, wood, wood collapse. It won't be vinyl, obviously. It'll be a, a true individual siding piece and it'll be painted to match the house. The windows will be Marvin Ultimates with SDLs, simulated divided lights in a style to match the existing structure. Um, this is just basically the, the cutaway from from what it will be inside of it. It'll be a cathedral space, make it a little seem a little larger while you're in the structure. And there's actually a there's a front porch section you can see in the top drawing. Where, so they'll have a little coverage from the weather. And obviously that window and that elevation is incorrect. This is the existing structure as it stands now. You can see at one point it had some sort of heat source in there, a chimney per stove. And then, um, like I said, it currently houses the pool equipment and has changing facilities in there very rough. So um, let me just talk a little bit about the demolition um, delay, not delay, demolition as it applies to the historic district, the local historic district. Um, the way the, um, the, dem the local historic district is language works is um, we can, we meaning the commission can improve a demolition permit only if the building or structure to be demolished has been determined to have no significant historic merit or historic relationship to the district itself. So this um, we building was inventoried. Um, I don't remember the date of the inventory, uh, determined to be around 1920. And it's possible it could have been um, moved here, um, the foundation could have been moved. It's a little hard to tell. And um, we, so we, we demolition within the district is a um, kind of a, it's a very unusual situation. We don't, um, we haven't looked at many of these over the years, the district has been in existence. So this is, uh, we have to sort of follow our guidance guidelines pretty carefully. Um, one of the things that is often asked about is whether we, this uh, building could be relocated uh, as, as an alternative to just demolishing it. So that's something to, um, to discuss. And as you probably know from the um, design standards that were developed for the district a number of years ago, which are on the city website, there are a number of 
uh, things that we look for as being compatible with the district itself. <clears throat> and part of it um, is just demolition, demolition in general, but then there are also specifics about the details of the design of what's being proposed there. I just wanted to read a couple of, um, of the criteria that fall under the demolition category. I don't know how many folks have looked at this in case the commissioners have not. I wanted to just read this out loud. Um, the first is where a new building or structure will replace a building or structure to be demolished or removed. Approval of the new structure by the commission is required as a condition to approving the demolition permit. So that's why we're here. In addition to the plans and specs ordinarily required for a new building or structure, the applicant shall submit a timetable and such other guarantees and assurances for the completion or replacement of the building or structure as we may require. If this building is demolished, we determine that it, it can come down. Um, we will ask that the building be um, completely documented. So that would be including um, details of elevations, any notable architectural features, and that these be measured and that photographs be taken. So these are um, the standards of the, the district. Um, and then secondly, when it comes to new construction, so we're moving on from whether this is demolished or not, but to new construction, there are several design considerations site for site and building. And I, I think it's going to be really important for the commissioners to um, consider all of these. This is our charge to do this. Um, so if the commissioners do not feel like we have enough information about this, I think it's um, completely within our purview to ask for more. Um, so those are, these are things that include site consideration scale, massing, proportion height, roof shape, fenestration, materials, and architectural character and details. So I think all of those things need to be answered and addressed before we can make a decision. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is this is a little different um, than the demolition delay bylaw, which governs um, properties outside the district um, that are visible from a public way. Um, if a building is within the district, it doesn't really matter whether it's visible or not. It still becomes part of the district. So we have to consider that just in case anybody was wondering. So with that, I would like to um, open it up to questions of the commissioners. Do you have questions for the applicant? Barbara, Greg, Michael. Um, I, I did go by there. I think it was just yesterday to to take a look at the building, and um, I know that uh, it was it Steve, right? Steve, Steve, he said that it was not in the in particularly good condition. This building. I, and as I said, I could only see it from the outside. It certainly looks like it's been kept up nicely and painted and it it looked to be in reasonable condition to me. Again, I don't know about its its structure, just its appearance. But I, I know that as a commission, we're really, um, we're becoming more and more concerned about the loss of these accessory buildings um, in the whole city, not just, not just in the um, Elm Street district. So, um, if this is in reasonable condition, I would, it would make me much happier if it were moved or somehow it becomes part of, if you have to make it a little bigger, part of this new building that you want to um, put in there. Um, I'd, I'd certainly be happier with that happening and it being reused and uh, um, modified. Um, let me see, wait a minute, I have a note here. Let me just look. Oh, sorry, I think I think that's all I have to say at the moment. Is that something that was considered uh, trying to retrofit that building? It's you know it's it was built as a shed, so it's all everything is it doesn't conform to the um, standards that we would want for the for a new structure. You know, what I mean, we, to to try to insulate it to the proper levels and you know put smooth surfaces on so the while yes it is well 
it's painted and they didn't let it fall to, to ruin on the outside. That's got nothing to do with how it was actually constructed and, um, you know, the, the cost of turning it and moving it and jack. Essentially, I would have to jack it up, put a new foundation in to turn mm -hmm. it to make it a conforming structure. And mm -hmm. by the time I do that, it's, it's more cost effective for the customer and, and, and the end result will be a better product for the homeowner um, with a new structure that hopefully meets your approval. Okay. Um, did, uh, Martha, did you say that there was, uh, there was um, research done on this as part of the inventory process for the district? It is, um, there is a form B on it. It's mostly, it mostly relates to the house, which right. um, was constructed in the 18th century, we believe. Um, I think that Bonnie Parsons, who did the inventory uh, form, um, was basing the date of this based on the way it was constructed. I would imagine that's probably true, Sarah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, there were a lot of unknowns about this property. It, it appears to have been moved, but no one quite knows why. Um, so that it, it's been changed over the years, not just recently, but um, pretty much ever since it was constructed. And the Form B didn't mention the, the outbuilding at all, although the assessors have a date of construction listed as 1920. Okay. So they say that this was built in 1920. Uh, um, and that's all that's all we know from the inventory, the 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 structure that's there. The, the the question in my mind, the question is if it's if it's a shed that was built in 1920, um I'm trying to kind of grasp the the historical value of this accessory building. I mean, I understand that we have a concern about accessory buildings, but I'm trying to get a, a a sense of, you know, as I look at things from the street and as I think of how the historical district presents itself, is this building significant? Do we have any sense of the significance? Because that's what I'm I, I'm a little bit lost about. Yeah, I think that we don't really have much information about it. So that's um, a little why we're a little bit handicapped about it, handicapped here. Yeah. Greg, do you have any questions or thoughts about it? I'm just wondering about its uh, historic uh, significance also. Well, wondering, you know, you're built and the force moved here then. But it's an unknown. Okay. So. All right. So there's that. Um, Let's um let's just move a little bit past the demolition um, and talk a little bit about what's being proposed. And as you all uh, heard me, um, there are several criteria that need to be met uh, to adhere to our standards uh, for new construction. And um, I would like the commissioners to weigh in on whether they feel like they have enough information about all of these elements to um, make a determination if we were to approve a demolition. I, I did look at those, the plans briefly. I um, maybe not carefully enough to know, to re realize whether materials were specified enough. Um, so I might defer to somebody else who might have looked, I apologize, who might have looked at it more in more detail, more closely to see, or yeah, we could just look at it now, I guess. But again, but as I said, I did look at it, but um, so this is, yeah, Stephen yeah, right. has outlined right. um, materials. Right, right. Um, well, well, like I said, it, it's called out as materials to match the existing house. Uh, it's not going to be a vinyl sided slammed together thing. This client knows what they want and they they do things right. You know, I've worked for them many times on many projects in, in town and um, they don't skimp, basically, is what I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. 
um, let me ask you this. Do, does your company have the ability to simulate this at all um, in three dimensions? I'm not I, requiring it. I'm just asking if you do. I could ask my designer if he could do that. I'm not quite sure what um, what what are you looking to see? I guess is my question. I think the thing is, um, most a lot of people can't uh, by looking at a plan, and even at elevation, it's difficult to imagine um, what this would look like in space. And so, having a three dimensional image would help. I think decision making to see how it might change, you know, the look of that property. Um, you want the structure in 3D or the whole property in 3D? The structure and its context. So, um, yeah, I think that would really help this. But again, if you don't have the, if you don't have the capability of doing that, then um, it's, I think it, it's beyond our... Um, yeah, well, it's, it's not something the designer could just whip out in 20 minutes for sure. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do the commissioners, are you having a difficulty at all imagining what this would look like on site? Barbara, Greg, Michael? Um, I, I would say yes. <laughs> I, mean, I don't, I'm not really good at looking. I, I, I agree. I'm not really good at looking at the plan and seeing it. And um, it was, um, but I think the, the, the site plan that was presented certainly gives me an idea of how it's changed you know how the position will change it'll be a little farther back on the property but but tilted um so and mm -hmm. i know our 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 um decision isn't just based on visibility from the street because it would probably i'm assuming the way it's moving it's actually going to be a little less visible from the street or at least from elm street than it than it is now yeah um, i was just going to mention that it's i don't know how relevant it is that it's mostly blocked from the street view and it will be more blocked in the new in the new position so i don't know if that matters or, or not mm -hmm. it does i think that um it, it does matter and i think that that's one reason why i it would help to have a little bit more um like a, a three-dimensional view but again if that's not possible that's it's not i think it's realistic for you, us to ask about it um sarah could you go back to the proposed site plan please Okay. So the scale of the building is the same. It's just, the, it, matter of fact, it's identical to the scale that's there now. Um, the only thing that changes is the six foot addition for the porch. And are you gonna be putting in a whole new foundation for this? Like take, dig, are you, yes. when you demolish, you're taking a it, you're foundation, yeah. it. So is there a reason why this has to be at an angle? Excuse me? Is this a, re the a reason why this has to be angled? If you're putting yeah, in a whole new to meet the setback for the for the next meeting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, you know, if you aligned it with the house, and I'm not going to mention but then the it, pool, it, but... then it would crowd the pool. We found we found it was too it was crowding the pool too much, and then it it, it became overbearing to the pool. You know what I okay. mean? Okay. Aligned yeah. it with the house. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just okay. I, I also kind of think that visually it it probably looks nice being a little bit offset as opposed to sort of like yeah uh, lined up. I, I kind of like the the layout. Um I, I have a question about um so the will the pool mechanicals be in the building as well this time or how is that being handled? Just I think they'll probably go to the rear. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. So then, the the inside the building, what we're what we'll have is um, just um, a kind of uh, uh, a studio apartment with uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, the 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 goal is to use it as a pool house when when Dad's not in town. Uh -huh. It's not it's not going to be built as a future rental. The uh, the, the kitchen for kitchenette is basically a breakfast bar, coffee bar type situation. It's not a full cooking kitchen, it's a uh -huh. sink and under counter refrigerator. Uh -huh. And then uh, uh, you were talking about Marvin windows and hardy siding. Is yep. that right? And then with the hardy siding, is that going to emulate the look of? Oh, yeah, definitely. It's individual individual pieces. Uh -huh. you know, 
that'll be up to the final budgeting constraint. But quite honestly, um, Cedar siding, the Hardy siding, they're not that far apart these days. To as far as installation or or material cost goes, it's just Hardy holds paint better. To be honest with you, that's the main uh -huh. why I would think about doing it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. But if you know, you guys say it's got to be um, wood. I'm I'm cool with that too. And what about the roofing material? The what? The roofing material. Oh, it'll be um, um, textile shingles, just like that's on the rest of the structures now. I noticed that the um, garage has scalloped shingles on it. So that's. But the main house does not. Right. I noticed that too. Right. Okay. All right. So what we're going to see, um, just looking here, uh, for, you know, when we're passing on Elm Street, what we're going to see is um, this kind of porch-like entrance to the building. Yep. Well, you can't really see it from Elm Street because the garage, which is a third structure on the property, is basically yeah. in the, is basically in front of it. So only from an angle can you really see it. Okay. Like if yeah. you're standing and, and the, the porch gable is closed in. It's not going to have the cathedral look to it. So it's you're still mm -hmm. going to see the, a gable from the from the street. Okay. If you see anything over the fence, mm -hmm. the, okay. and then, the ceiling will be cathedral, but the gable will not be. Right. I just want to ask for a clarification. I think you said that now, like any mechanical things, pumps or whatever for the pool are in that pool shed. But they're going to be outside of it when you build the new structure. Correct. Behind it. Okay. Behind it, or we might build a, a little cover for it out back. Currently, it's it's half in, half out. There's a um, is um, heat air exchange heater on it, so the pump is in the house right now, and the in a heat exchanger is on the outside. Okay. Um. All right, and then in terms of the, um, I'm just thinking of the context, the abutters, it looks like you are improving the property line on, Correct. I guess, the east side, right? Yep. Because um, you, you're, you're pulling the building away from the east, east property line. I'm saying east because I'm visualizing the drawing. And I understand the north what you mean, up. the one to the right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, are you going to be removing any vegetation? Not to my knowledge, there isn't any um, there. Okay. Um, moving the mechanicals out of the building, is that gonna create a noise problem? An increased noise? I, I don't um, think so. You know, it's a pretty standard practice to have pool equipment outside. But like I said, if we have to, we can build a shed. Just around. know that the fountain up at the State Hospital Park had to be put inside a um, a building to mask the noise because the neighbors were concerned about it. That's why I'm asking that. Uh, so, okay, so I'm going to come back again to go just um, circle back. What I'm hearing is that the commissioners do not feel like they have a lot of information about this structure. Is determine whether it's historically significant or not. Am I am I correct about that? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yeah, of the existing structure, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, if Dylan were here, he might have a little bit more information about it. He probably would have looked at historic maps, which we like to see uh, to be able to determine whether it was on it um, earlier in the twentieth century. Okay. So we don't have that information. And um, again, I'm gonna ask, does everyone feel like they have enough information about the scale of the building, its impact on the site, the massing of the new building, the proportion, the height, the roof shape, the windows, the materials, and the architectural detail? Um, I think it would be helpful if, if possible to get some sort of 3D representation of it and, you know, in sort of putting it in situ so we could see that. And, and I just have one other question, Martha. Normally, I, during our meetings, if there's someone who wants to comment on a specific agenda item, we allow that public comment. Yes, I'm yeah, getting okay. to that. So you're going to get to that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I didn't know if any of the people were neighbors. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure that all the comments from the commissioners or questions have been answered and my own of course too 
You know, I think that some of the things that you were pointing out, Martha, um, uh, could it would be helpful to me if even if we don't have a 3D rendering of it, it would be helpful to me if we could get, for example, on the elevations. Um, I know they're um, done to a scale here, but it'd be it'd be good to know, you know, like what is the height of the roof? Um, and how does that compare to the, you know, I, as I understand it, it's being presented as it's equivalent to the existing structure, more or less, that we're going to have the same dimensions. But it would be nice to see that, um, at least specifically in the documentation itself. So if we could get that kind of information as far as the, as far as the shape of the structure, that would be helpful. Am I Am I missing it somewhere? Is it already there? I, you know, I don't know if he did it, quite honestly. And the goal is to even to make the pitch match identical to what it is now and everything. So the, the only difference would be it's got to be slightly higher above grade to get the siding the eight inches away from grade. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Right now it sits right on the ground. So in essence, it would rise about eight to 12 inches from where it is now i see okay yeah that's the kind of thing that i was i was just trying to get a sense of i mean we are basically no, I, I, I i was very um aware of you know, wanting to stay as close as possible to matching that ex existing structure that's exactly why we stayed with the 20 by 20 footprint because that's I see. exactly what it is now and you know the roof the roof pitch will be identical to what it is now so all those things aren't going to change. Like I said, the only difference will be how much we need to elevate it to get the siding away from the ground. I personally am not a fan of raising structures too tall. Uh -huh. just, I see a lot. I see it happening a lot in this town lately, where they they are putting too much foundation underneath the house. It's just wrong. That is absolutely true. Um, okay, uh, Greg or Barbara, do you have any other questions? Okay, no, so I, I'd like to just give opportunity for others in the audience um, to um, comment if they'd like to. And uh, as I said, please identify yourself by name and where you live. Uh, Martha, I'll just jump in quickly. So this yeah. is the 1902 Sanborn map and the shed is shown here uh, or a shed. There's no way to know if it's the same structure or a different structure. Uh, uh. But that it looks to be in the same location as um, as the existing structure. So right, okay. right where the date stamp is, if you can't see my mouth. Yes. Okay, great. That's helpful. All right. Are there is there anyone in the in attendance who would like to speak about this or ask questions? We'd be welcome. Your welcome comments are welcome. Yes, Marty and Marisa. Yeah. Um well, uh, we understand the need for this, uh, Stacy, and uh, for the home. And we appreciate well, Marissa, tell everybody where you live, please. I live and who you are. Uh, <laughs> I'm the property east uh, of it. So 187 Elm Street. So it's the house, it's the neighbor. Next door. Yeah, right next door. So uh, I definitely size, you know, was a, a little bit of a concern to see. We, I'm glad to see where it's going to be placed. I feel that the application is kind of lacking in specifics. It's something to say, well, they do a good job. They're going to do this. They're going to have taste. They got not the owners, but I'm you're speaking of the the uh, the architects or the uh, builders. But um, really, I feel in an application there should be more specifics. Um, and again, you pointed to uh, the stats on the on the building. It it really needs to be more exact. I would say. And if you say you're going to put mechanical uh, pieces outside of the shed. Well, we have, a, we certainly like them covered. We have, uh, you know, indicated, and when I say we, the district, I know they have to be covered by a shrubbery or fence or something. And you say, well, maybe we'll build a shed, maybe not. Uh, you know, when you're, if this is my yard next door, I kind of say, well, maybe you're going to build a shed. What kind of shed? You're going to tell me it's tasteful. I don't know. I mean, I have to really, I kind of want to know what you're going to put there. Are you going to put shrubbery around it? What kind of mechanical pieces are going to be there? So it's a little, um, 
it's a little vague for me. The porch will, I understand why you would want a porch. It's very nice for someone to sit out. That will change. Will change the probably doesn't go with that style of that house. But if the district decides that's fine to put, that's fine to put. But I think uh, that's why I just feel that there's some specifics uh, here that are lacking that can make this in, you know more presentable to the district. Um, we don't have a final say in it. You all do, but. Uh, you know, as you were going along, that seems to be, that's my concern here. Marty, do you have anything to say? Well, it seems to me that um, that pictures from the street would be helpful. I mean, we're talking about what it looks like, but we can't really see what it looks like from here. Um, so pictures from the street as it is now. And in terms of the rendition of a completed structure, the software nowadays makes it pretty easy, maybe not in 20 minutes, but certainly within a few days, to construct what it would actually look like. Um, it's 3D completed structure with the pump house, wherever that is attached. I mean, the, the capability now technologically is, is pretty pretty good. So we can see what it looks like now from where, what it would look like completed and look like it's there. So that would be the best way in my mind to understand this better. The the um the drawings, one they look different and the size looks different. You're saying it's twenty by twenty, but it looks like a rectangle, so it's confusing. That's it is twenty by twenty. I know that for a fact. Um, but, but the pictures. If you, if you look at a two, you see the size of the structure. It is twenty by twenty. Um, actually, if you didn't put the horse, the the width. I just noticed on it, but I believe it's somewhere else because that was our goal was to stay within the size of of the existing structure. The only diff, the only add-on is the six foot for the porch. Yeah. Yeah. The six foot forward on the porch. Forward, correct. But so then some of the construction. So that's why it looks like a trying a rectangle because it is. Okay. okay. Yes, yeah. exactly. But that's why we also turned it and tucked it back a little more into the property. So for me, I think more realistic pictures of what it is and what it would look like with the software that's available would be helpful. Thank I'll have you. Design and see if I can that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes. Is it Lily? Le you're uh, muted, you're Lily. Lally. I'm mm -hmm. probably saying that incorrectly, but you're muted. Lolly's muted. It's Lolly. You're muted. Lolly. Lolly. Okay. <laughs> Lolly, you're muted. <laughs> now you're frozen. <laughs> oh no. There you go. Oh, oh. No. There you go. There you go. So please oh, identify yourself you. and your address. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Lala Burke. I am the other neighbor on our backyards uh, adjoin each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marty and Marissa have said uh, what um, um, was on my mind very nicely. And uh, one concern I have is um, the mechanicals. Um, and I just realized this when the conversation now was happening. If the mechanicals are moved outside of a structure, there might be a noise implication. And uh, that is our house is. Uh, and the porch and where we summer um, out of the house is uh, very, very close uh, to our good neighbors. So I was just um, concerned about any potential noise being a consequence of what's going to happen. And if that's the case, it would be nice to, at this planning stage, to perhaps um, plan so that that's avoided. Thank you, Lolly. Anybody else? Okay. Um, Marissa, do you have one other thing yeah, you'd like to one, say? Yeah, uh, kind of um, specific, and I guess I carried this over from my time. But uh, I, I don't know if there is a depiction of doors there. I don't see, I, um, you know, what what kind of door they're intending to use, and you know, I think it's kind of to me looks like it needs a few specifics there. Are there shutters? Are there doors? Are there, you know? Yeah. Final door has not been selected yet. Mm -hmm. The final door has not been selected yet. 
Yeah, but I think something has to be proposed. I think that's the whole thing. I think before approval, things have to be proposed and you have to see what you're approving because we all know what it's like when it's too late because we've already bought the doors and we've already bought the windows and we've already we've been there. So not we on the, as a commission, I'm saying. So I, I just think that that will help, you know, the application and it just helps an easy, facilitates a, a, a decision just to have everything ahead of time. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so this is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that um, we don't have a lot of information about its history. I'll now, although we do know that there was a structure there um, early in the 20th century. And uh, it sounds to me like um, there is a need for some additional detail. And again, all of the items that we need to consider are laid out very clearly in the design. Uh, standards. Uh, um, so what I'm hearing is I think we would like some more information and possibly, uh, if possible, some more renderings of this, what this is going to be, um, before we can really make an informed decision. As I said when I started speaking, this is very unusual for us to get an application to remove something from the district. Hmm. And so we have, you know, again, uh, is the responsible stewards of historic properties in the city, we have to consider all this stuff. Um, we're not trying to be enemies of anybody, but this is something that we really need to give a lot of thought to and have more detail on. And it is the responsibility of the applicants to present the information um, to us. You know, we can only um, do so much on our end. And if you know you you own a property or you're working on a property and you want to get approval, um, you need I think you need to come to us with a lot more information and show us how you're going to meet the criteria that are in the de design standards and um, more more information about the history possibly. So both of those things I think would help us make a better decision. And if that's something you can do in the next um, in a few weeks, uh, we could take this up again in September. That's what I'm hearing. I would like confirm, we need to have a motion on this, correct, Sarah? Um, we would, yes. Um, and there, the commission has 60 days to make a determination um, unless the applicant consents to um, an extension. So our next scheduled meeting would be September 30th, which is uh, seven days past the, the 60 day window. It's seven days past yep. window. Okay. So we could either meet in the interim or um, the applicant would need to consent to an, an extension. Okay. All right. Uh, well, first of all, I would need to have a motion from one of the commissioners as to uh, what I essentially just stated, if that's the way we want to go. And um, we, we need to vote on that. So if anybody would like to form a motion. I would move that is, is the term to postpone this decision or to continue the discussion and the of the um, application of change to the outbuilding at 197 Elm Street till our next scheduled meeting. Um, so the commission would just need to make sure that the applicant would consent to. So our next scheduled meeting, assuming that the applicant would agree to a um, this one week extension over the 60 day requirement to make a decision. Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm hoping to get the foundation in the ground before the weather turns. So um, how about I submit the new stuff and that you're asking for and we go from there? Do we have to have we a formal have, meeting for, for that? Yeah, we do. We would have to have another meeting, which we could do earlier than that if people are, if we can get a quorum together. Yeah, the, the I mean, the commission could meet on the 23rd. That would be an option as well. That, that's fine with me. Um, I do I do think that, you know, that some of the notes you may have on the specific things that people were asking about i think it's important to be responsive to that i also think that um as the neighbor suggested 
the mechanicals are part of the structure and how they're going to be handled is an important part of the application. Right. Well, well, I'll, I'll so, so I just wanted to make sure that we're clear on that, that, that I think that's an important consideration as well. And not, you know, it's, it's, it's this idea of having a sense of what the whole package is going to be like and how it's going to affect the historical district and the neighbors and et cetera. So I think it'll be helpful. So, so I could just amend my um, motion that pursue, uh, pursuant to receiving more details uh, and information as we discussed at this meeting on the project at 197 Elm, we would the commission would meet on September 23rd. Um, and again, that has to be assuming that we could get a quorum for that um, to to continue the discussion this project so would that work for the commissioners who are present that'll work for me i think so i will yes. not be i will not be in attendance but um i think there's just five of us anyway so right so the a, a vote would still need to um, be a quorum of the full commission so you still would need four okay um but uh someone could watch like dylan could watch the video and and still be able to participate. I just don't know if that's a night that's um, that would work for him. Okay. So if not, um, then it would have to be the thirtieth, and we would have to ask for seven days from you in order to do that. Is is there any sense of when um, documents could actually be available to see? I mean, I know I couldn't find any documents before today around this application. Maybe I wasn't looking right, but the sooner people could see it, the more time could be used to evaluate it. So as soon as, as soon as I have them available and they and um, the, the board looks at them, it's up to them to post them. Um, yeah, the, this, the material has been available since it was since the application. Exactly. Where do I am now? Definitely. All of all of these drawings and all were available. Yeah. Uh, so July twenty fourth, <laughs> that they were published. So or you yeah. could just send me an email and I'll, I can email them to you if you're having a hard time. Um, I will talk to my designer tomorrow and see what he can work up as far as um, some more detailed plans. And I will talk with the homeowner to discuss the relocation of the equipment. You know, there's some equipment that has to maintain outside, which it is now as already, which is the heater. Um, but, and we'll talk, I'll discuss with them how they want to, do that and I'll even I'll see if I can get them to select the door. So. Okay. So uh Barbara, are did you want to make a revision to that motion? Um I think I had is did I not do yeah so enough of that? Yeah, <laughs> so just just to confirm that, that September 30th date is is acceptable to the applicant. If, if that's what it has to be, yeah, exactly. I figured like, I would make this. I don't know what my designer's plan, plans are, quite honestly. I don't control his world, so I'm not even sure how quickly he can turn these things around for me. So, um, so what is like it? So, I guess my question is what is there a review period after it passes or fails? So the so the applicant would need to agree to this extension um, and the continuation of the hearing until September thirtieth. Yes, that's fine. And okay. and can and when would the materials need to be made available? The new design, in advance, uh, as quickly as you can get them. Um, right. But no no later than a, a week before the the meeting to give people a chance to review. I I don't foresee that being a problem. So probably the only amendment, Sarah, to I, I do have the motion. Okay, with so, so uh, it would be a, a it would motion be the twenty third or the thirtieth. Yeah, the, September thirtieth at five thirty, and thirtieth probably is more likely. I would say. Okay, and I will be in attendance for that. So, okay. Can I just remind, yeah, the applicant that just for your own benefit, just come prepared with how you're going to conceal mechanics. You know, you got to know what your intent is in some schematic of how you're going to some depiction of how you will intend to conceal mechanics, whatever's there, not just what will be there. I think that's important. 
the more complete. Well, you know, I quite honestly, I hadn't thought that, that yeah. much about it because yeah. quite often the pool mechanics are placed up outside and <laughs> shockingly against the fence, closest to the neighbor, away from the, from them. So, um, yeah, but you, you it, don't know what to address. make the depiction, <laughs> with the, but with the design <laughs> may not need much, but it may. Yeah, like, yeah, I understand. Yeah. I have a pool. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, I, I would say as a former pool owner that, you know, um, trying to think in terms of sound abatement, if the if the mechanicals were inside, if they're going to be outside, be thinking not just about concealing them visually, but any kind of um, measures that can be taken to um, take into account sound abatement so that there's a sense. Um, yeah, right. But, yeah. But the... the Pumps are pumps, you know, and pumps make noise and they're exactly, ways... exactly. But you also have to maintain them, so you have to have a certain amount exactly. Of right. You know, so it's a combination of those. Now we've added more to the structure to, to conceal the pump and right. Know. Is that gonna be an issue that there that will add more to the structure itself if now we need something to conceal that equipment? Does that affect anything? So if if the equipment would be fully invisible from um, Elm Street even absent any fences or uh, secondary structures, then that would be exempt. Um, but I think demonstrating that it either would meet the design criteria or be exempt would be important. Okay, well, it's not visible from Elm Street now and it, it, wouldn't, it would, would still not be visible at all from the street. Um, so, I mean, it would be visible potentially to the neighbors, but not from the, not from the street, from the neighbor's backyard. Looking over a five foot fence. Yeah. All right. So I would just uh, well, okay. So we need to take a, a uh, there needs to be a second to the motion and we need to vote on this. I, I second the motion. Okay. And Sarah, do you have a clear idea what the motion is? Clear? Yes. Uh, so okay. continuation until September 30th. At five right. Um, okay. So and second. So roll call. Greg? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Michael? Yes. And Martha? Yes. And I would just, you know, again, recommend that you look at the design standards and be sure that all of the items that are included in this are addressed, um, you know, in your follow up. And then any, any, again, information um, about the history of the building, that well, would be very helpful as well. I don't know where I'm going to find that, you know. I'm, it's not my my expertise for sure. I mean, I, all the paperwork I have on it, none of it has shown up from the different site plans I have. It's not on, on there, so. Um, okay. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> it's not like it's signed and dated inside. I'm just, yeah, I'm just saying that we, it's something that we have to consider, obviously, if the bill yeah, is I, I understand that. I just don't know how to go about yeah. dating when it was yeah. there. Well, one of our one of our commissioners who isn't here tonight, Dylan Gaffney, works in at Forbes Library. So I don't know whether we're planning to ask him, but you could ask him if he finds any uh, photographs or just any other information which he might have in you know the local history section of of Forbes, because he has found things for us when when other projects have come up. Sometimes he's found a very useful photograph. Or or his I would ask historic Northampton because they have street photographs they have a, a large collection of photographs as well um, so you could contact them as well and uh, I, I, we've been to no historic Northampton and they don't have any oh, okay any images of the house okay I don't know about the library but sir we can ask Dylan to follow up on that right yeah okay. All right, so we will be looking for um, more detail from you, Stephen, and we will reconvene on the 30th of September to review it. Yo. And, and thank you for all the information you did provide. It's a lot to think about. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, we need to move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is the section 106 review for the Crafts Avenue downtown housing, Valley CDC. Thank you, district, so um, Thank you for keeping us in the loop, everybody. Oh, you're welcome. Um, yes. 
Thank you. just there. You're welcome, Holly. Um, the so uh, uh, as you probably read in the staff report, um, because this project project may I'm, I hope I'm saying this right. This project is receiving some federal funding or funding that's coming from the federal government. Um, we need to review the uh, plans for this. And if we want, make an opinion about it. It's not something we need to vote on, but uh, Mass Historical, because um, it's in the historic district, Mass Historical uh, will want to know if we have any thoughts about it as they continue to work with the federal government um, through Section 106. So uh, it looks like we have a representative from the architects, two, maybe yeah. two representatives. Yep. So, so you have Bill with Valley CDC, uh, the owner of yeah. the parcel, um, and then we have Jill with with the architecture firm. So yeah, Jill, <laughs> Jill DeCourcy with Jones Whitset. Yeah. Apologies, I couldn't change my name on the on the Zoom. <laughs> no worries. Thank you for uh, both appearing. And um, yeah, so. You, uh, do, um, you submitted some uh, your PNF, so we have that information that um, you pulled together for that. Um, do you have any? Can you just kind of give us an overview of your, where you are with things? I know we you presented for us before. We made a couple of suggestions, and um, it looks like you prepared some response to that. So if you could maybe just uh, bring us up to speed, that'd be great. Sure. So we, um, I can share our presentation. And right. then we can kind of just go through there. Um, Perfect. And can I get permission to share screen? Uh, it should work now. Okay. All right. Are you seeing the cover slide? Okay. Perfect. So Bill is going to just introduce the um, the project where we're at. And I know that we we have come before you before, <laughs> so we don't want to bore you with, you know, repeating everything, but we are just going to, you know, flip through slides so that we can kind of refresh everybody about the kind of the context and, and how we got to where we are, but we'll focus on um, focus on changes since the last presentation primarily. But I'll let Bill start. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, commissioners, and, and thank you again for having us here. Um, so I, I only have, I think, three or so slides, and they're very basic. I, I wanted to orient folks on the project. Uh, it looks like the commissioners are the same from the prior year, uh, but just for the, the record, I wanted to kind of go through it again. Uh, so this is actually, um, and, and Jill, if you want to go to the next slide here, you, you can kind of um, see exactly what the parcel is. This is a, a classic infill uh, location where it really presents itself for downtown transit oriented qualities. Uh, it's a it's a lot that was originally owned by the city and was identified as a candidate for affordable housing. Uh, the city council actually approved um, an RFP for the parcel and, and uh, Valley's proposal was the one that was selected. And this was probably a couple of years ago now. Um, since then, we, we went in front of the uh, commission, uh, I think right before our zoning board hearing. Uh, and soon after that, we did get the zoning approvals. Um, it, basically, it's an as of right project that we're, we're doing. We're not doing a 40B here. Uh, so we're largely looking for the site plan approvals and such. Um, but generally speaking, the, the parcel was kind of created for this, this use in, in the sense that the boundary of it uh, is more or less, you know, plus or minus the the boundary of the building itself. It, it sits almost entirely on the lot. You can see uh, it was actually creation of two separate lot, uh, parcels, uh, one and in, in, uh, this kind of parcel B. Uh, both are very small, 0 0.06 of an acre um, in size. So um, we can actually go to the next slide here and I can give you a sense of what the RFP required it. It was a very um, kind of uh, stringent requirement and and goal posts we have to hit. So uh, this building is designed to a very high uh, energy performance standard of passive house uh, using no fossil fuels. Uh, so it's a it's a challenge, um, you know, even in today's world for new construction to get you know modern kind of high rise buildings to meet this standard. Um, the kind of program of the space is is a minimum of twenty units. Um, but in order for us to get the economics to work, we're going to be providing 30 uh, homes in the in the area and, and, you know, trying to still 
play within the boundaries of the zoning uh, a code for uh, the side district of central business. Um, so in the majority of these units need to be uh, kind of 30% of the area median income, which we define here as extremely low income. Um, anybody in, in that criteria is considered at risk of being homeless. And, and that is really the, the genesis of this RFP is to you know, focus a lot of the attention towards providing homes for people who are currently unhoused. Uh, if we do not um, show progress or build towards it within the five years, uh, the parcel actually reverts back to the city. Um, and you can go to the next slide and I can give you a little, that's perfect here. So basically out of the 30 units, um, you know, we'll have an elevator that runs up and down the building, which uh, I think Jill will kind of talk a little bit on, but um, it'll, it'll be highly accessible with, with, you know, we'll be providing it also um, Department of Mental Health um, tenants here. We'll be providing a, a 20 of those with extremely low income. Uh, 10 of them are going to be at like a moderate kind of workforce uh, at 60% AMI. And then the ground floor of the program space is actually going to be on-site property management and then a, a resident service coordinator. So this is a, um, a kind of a new position that's been formed where uh, they per, they're basically on site, separate from the property manager, and they're providing you know resident services. So they're they're helping folks get onto food stamps. They're you know basically kind of liaison on really any issues that come up on site. It, it really helps us you know for these larger buildings kind of reduce you know uh, issues that would be dealt from like emergency responders. Um, so having that on-site presence from the property manager and resident service coordinator, I, I think is going to be a very professionally uh, ran building, and I think will be a, a really good asset to have downtown. Um, you know, particularly because it relates itself well to that transit-oriented qualities. I think I don't know if that's my last one here, but um, I don't know if we want to pause and talk any of the program, or if we want to just kind of dive right into the historic. I mean, that's really the meat of I think what we're looking at here for the, the 106 review. I did I mean, just want to orient commissioners on the, you know, the project itself in case folks are are wondering. I think it might be maybe useful at this point just to give a quick update on where we are in timeline, just so you sure. know. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that bill or I can just say that we are, you know, getting to about 90% CDs. So we're pretty far along um, <clears throat> with the process. We are going uh, have submitted for our final passive house certification. So that's that's kind of where we're where we're at. Um, but there's still the whole funding round to go. So that is where the section 106 comes in and that's what Bill's going to be doing for the next year is working and getting funding for the project. So just to give you the picture of of where we're at time wise. Um, Does MHC require the 90% for the PNF? Uh, not that uh, I'm aware of for the um, the district review. Okay. Uh, I think you'd see that for like a historic building that's undergoing like a certain type of application. But I think for the 106, they're looking more at the, you know, the, the elevations and they're really trying to understand uh, color context and such. Um, okay. I so think the 90% um, the plans really came out of uh, one of the grants that the city secured uh, for the project to advance to um, like construction ready plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think what we're looking at and just, you know, what's on this slide anyways is showing where the project is, the yellow dot within the downtown historic district. So it is a site that is undeveloped. So it's all new construction. It's not, you know, um, in in conflict with anything existing on the site, but it is, you know, our goal and understanding that we want to be compatible with the district and not detracting from the district in any way. And there's a number of different factors um, influencing the project, the historic district, the context. Also, it's in a, um, a form-based code overlay zone. So there's some very prescriptive um, design guidelines from the zoning standpoint. And then it's also passive house. So a lot of um, different competing elements there. But we're here because of the historic district today. Um, and uh, just again, looking at the site plan. And like I said, I might, I'm not going to go into as much detail because I know you've seen this before. If you do have questions, I'm happy to, to do a little bit, to talk a little bit more, but just kind of the, the overview, the site Bill had located this. Um, it is an unusual shaped 
parcel. We are trying to maximize the footprint as much as possible um, just to get in as much affordable housing as we are able to. And I did want to just do one side-by-side -side comparison. What's on the left is what we had presented last year, and what's on the right is our current proposal. You can see the footprint hasn't changed. It's um, really driven by the constraints of the site. But the, the one change I wanted to highlight for this commission is that we have um, extended the design to include a reworked parking lot at the back of City Hall and kind of up at the upper level of this building. So we, because there is a 20 foot retaining wall as part of this project, it requires a lot of excavation. So we were gonna be excavating pretty far into the parking lot anyways. And um, we are also now, and this is one of the more significant changes that has happened since our last presentation, is that the building has changed its mechanical system to be from VRF to now be ground source heat pumps or geothermal. So that's really great for the um, project from an energy performance standpoint. Um, and it actually has some, I think, positive um, impacts on the overall uh, design of the building as well. So in the in the parking lot comparison, so we have the new parking lot being designed because that's where the boreholes for the geothermal are going to be located. So it's already being torn up. We might as well rework it. And this addresses some of the safety concerns and the efficiency concerns the city had had with that lot beforehand. The impact to our building in terms of the kind of historic context is that we now have a much larger buffer between our building and the parking lot, which allows for um, considerably more um, kind of landscaping around the north and the west side of the building. So I think that will, will sort of soften the, the building in its context and kind of ease that relationship between the building and its its neighbors. Okay, this is the, the site. We're all familiar with it. We're next to City Hall. We want to be a good neighbor and respectful of that. Um, one additional change since our last presentation is that we actually reduced the overall height of the building a little bit. It actually is four feet shorter than it was the last time we presented. Um, that just in the process of detailing mechanical and structure, we were able to get a little bit of efficiency out of getting those together and and shrink it down. So I think that that is going to be a just a positive in terms of how it fits into the immediate context of the the area. And um you know precedent for the design we looked at new construction downtown um trying to figure out what what was most successful in in buildings like facade depths and decorative cornices and and the use of masonry materials. And we also looked at multifamily residential because this project is 100% residential. Um, so our historic apartment buildings in Northampton do have a somewhat different character than the downtown commercial buildings. So keeping uh, both of those in mind in the design. And then, as I had mentioned, we are in... Um, the form-based code overlay area for a central business district side street. So it's not the main central business district, but the side street. And there's certain um, requirements that that uh, leads to in the, in the massing and the design of the building. So this is walking through how that form-based code uh, influenced the overall um, design of the building. Um, of course, it sets the height height limitations and the code requires a setback at the front of the building, which we wrapped around and extended to create a roof terrace for residents. And then um, it has uh, requirements for dividing the building into three parts and emphasizing vertical bays, all of which is great. It makes it more compatible with the surrounding building. So we're in favor of that, but this is you know, largely what drove us to get to where we are right now. So here is the um, view from Crafts Avenue. Um, you can see how we are breaking up the building. Um, instead of having just one monolithic structure, we're using the slope of the hill to try to step the building down. That setback allows us to do that roof terrace, um, which again helps to reduce the scale of the building 
the, the feeling of the building in scale on the south side that we're looking at. In terms of materials, we have brick, we have ground face block at the foundation, water table level. We have some, um, a little bit of um, like textured brick where we're doing some three-dimensional horsing. And then our secondary material between the windows is gonna be a vertical um, plank fiber cement siding with a kind of about an eight inch vertical spacing. And that's what's between the windows and at the at the upper levels. Mm -hmm. I did want to call out here. I know at our last meeting there had been a question about the roof terrace and if there was going to need to be a railing at that. So we have um, specified a. It's it's not a very large railing, but it adds on top of the parapet. We're looking at a glass railing right now to try to minimize the visual impact of that, but it does add a. Uh, a real layer of security for people who are on the roof. So you can see that depicted here. Um, this is the view looking down Crafts Avenue from the north. So I did want to do, in this case, a little side-by-side -side what we had shared with the commission last summer as opposed to the design now. As you can see, we really haven't made like big changes to the exterior of the building. We've been focused more on the interior um, uh, details, but we did make a few changes on this side. This was another area where we had gotten some feedback, I think from this commission about that north facade feeling a little bit like the back of the house and a, a little bit blank. So we did rework that um, to give it a more symmetrical layout, which is more consistent with the other facades, so it doesn't feel as uh, different, I think, from how it had previously. It felt like a different kind of language, so it's um, more symmetrical. We also, this is one of the other benefits of switching to, to geothermal heating, is that we were able to eliminate much of the rooftop equipment. And so now that we're only down to one um, DOAS system, instead of having to have all the compressors for the VRF, uh, the equipment is much further from the edge of the building. And we found that we were able to eliminate the roof screen without um, compromising views from the street. So the fact that there's no you know, roof screen for mechanical on the current elevation is actually correct. And that it is one of the benefits of the geothermal switch. Here's the view from the parking lot, and this shows the, the reconfigured parking lot design with the additional landscaping buffer between the building and the um, city hall lot. And, you know, this view is good at kind of illustrating how the we were trying to make a building which has, you know, quite a bit of density, quite a, a lot of units not feel overwhelming and too tall. And then just stepping back from Main Street and how this it relates to um, to City Hall from that that vantage point. So that that is the quick run through. Happy to go into more detail on any any slides or um, if you have additional questions. Okay, thank you, Jill. That was great. Yeah. Um, so Barbara and yes, is Greg still with? Us. Uh, well, I don't know. I see his name, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. Oh, but, maybe. Okay. I'm sorry. I just, I thought he might have uh, tapped. Yes. Okay. Um, Barbara or Michael or Greg, do you have questions for Jill or for so, Bill? So I do. Um, there are a couple things. And again, these are just aesthetics and just how it's striking me looking at it. Um, and you have like three very distinct colors here. The, the the ground floor, and I guess it goes up to the second floor, is sort of a white. Then you have your orangish brick. And then you have this kind of muted, I don't know, I guess it's tan, I would call it. Mm -hmm. Actually, could you leave that up there? Oh, sorry. I was going to go to... Um... Oh, showing what it is. But but my, Oops. Okay. my concern is that, again, you have like this three things. And I particularly... I would, I aesthetically would probably like it better if the bottom floor were closer to the color and maybe the same color as what's above, just so there's a more uniform 
at, uh, at the at right. the top level looks between right. the top and the bottom level yeah you mean. I, yeah I, I don't but again it's it's a personal yeah. but i don't like that contrast and the other thing is that i know there is some orangish brick and i again it's you know it's hard to tell i'm looking at it on a computer um what you're showing here does not look as orange as what i see in the drawing or the elevation but there is some orangish brick, but it's really near buildings that are reddish brick. And I feel like it really stands out um, too much being that orangey color. And mm -hmm. so that's my, and I, you know, I appreciate the fact that it's now a bit, it's more symmetrical. Um, you, you said the setback on the top level is required. It is. It, it is yeah. um, at okay. the at the front of the building. So yeah. we 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 expanded requires, it a little bit. Yeah, they require um, a setback. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. All right. That I think that's all I have to say at the moment about the aesthetics. And I also when this there won't be a staircase now from I mean when this is built from the city hall. Correct. So it it, it does right. it does eliminate the the right. staircase. No, yeah. I think that's fine because people can either go through the building or they can still go there's a ramp even up towards the towards the back of city hall i mean there's a way to get down there just a different way now okay thank you yeah and it, it, just to chime in i think that staircase was actually going to just be demolished uh, originally so i think the goal of this was almost kind of twofold where instead of rebuilding this retaining wall um you know right. they looked at hey can we put a building here and that actually was really the seed of this whole project so it was yeah important. yeah no, it makes sense. I just wanted to clarify that I wasn't missing seeing that a staircase had been yeah, stuck. The, the staircase is in really poor condition. I don't oh, know I know. Oh, I agree. Completely, yeah. But it's really, it's falling right. and it's yeah. significant repairs. And there also is the the new staircase uh, and ramp in Pulaski Park as well, which, which goes to the same place. Well, and I, I did actually just back to the materials. I, I did actually really like this slide, Jill, just because it really highlights more of the actual material choices. And, and I think maybe your slide 21, which is that elevation 2D, might even be a little more accurate on the colors. I mean, I, I think, you know, I think that I, rendering picks up a lot <laughs> of the sun. Maybe it's like a very sunny day, but I think, um, you know, yeah. these colors are muted versions of what you saw on the renders is, is my kind of understanding of it and Julie you can correct me if I'm wrong but no you're not wrong I mean I, th I think that it is you know we have like three different things here and they all show different colors which is an <laughs> unfortunate you know side effect of how the renderings get generated yeah. and and all of that but I, I we also have not picked the specific brick that we're using and right. so that all is kind of to be to come and I think it's it's great input you know, do we, we, do we go more towards the warm colors of city hall or a little bit more towards the brick? There's a bunch of different brick colors in that area. Right. So right. it's, you've got a, a lot to select from, but right. the overall concept right. for colors is right. warm neutrals, not too much contrast. Right. But, again, yeah. but, but regardless of what <laughs> the shades are, you have three distinct colors, the bottom, the middle, right. and the top. Yep. Right? Yep. Okay. Okay. But we, but I, I, I'm hearing you on that. That base is reading as a pretty strong uh -huh. pop right now, and maybe maybe it could be toned down some. Uh -huh. Barbara, thanks, Michael. Do you have any thoughts or questions? Well, I think I think you know Barbara points to something important here as far as thinking about how it fits into the area, and you know when we look at the at the renderings here, um, it's it's one thing to sort of see it when it's, uh, you know, taken out of context, but when you're thinking of it in relationship to the buildings around, like this picture here, I'm a little less concerned um, with the issue of the, the three gradations, very distinctive gradations of color. It's interesting that Barbara's more drawn to like what's happening on the bottom floor, which visually doesn't sort of, bother me as much as the top floor does. And I, I don't mean to, I mean, obviously these things, you know, everybody has their opinion about color and things like that. But um, I think it's important to think about it in the context of what's going on around it and, and keep that in mind when we think about these, uh, the selection of materials. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting challenge. Yeah, but Michael, I think when we first saw this, I mean, I. I don't know whether I should go through it again, but I, I, you know, you're saying the setbacks required. I really don't like the setback. And 
you know, yeah. the, if you even look to the building to the left of it, the way the cornice is there, uh -huh. and you look to the new building, if you didn't have that top thing at all, then it would just, to me, fit in better. Whereas mm -hmm. the style of that. I, I agree with you. Floor, I, that's why I was saying, I think the top part bothers me more visually. Yeah. Than, oh, than, I, yeah. I would agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. It sort of floats up there in a way that doesn't, yeah, it doesn't quite tie in with, I, I yeah, I, I see your point. Yeah, Michael, and I, I guess just to speak on that, I think, you know, from this view, I think it's very noticeable, but I think as you walk around on those sidewalks and you look up, I think because of that setback, you actually start losing the ability to really to see that upper floor. Mm. Um, just kind of how the cornice kind of protrudes out and then how the uh, kind of visualization works. I think from Main Street and then I think from, uh, not Crafts, but I think it's New South Street or, or Old South Street as it kind of connects down there where that original render was. I think that's where you really see that that uh, upper floor. Mm. But as you walk around the building because of its size, I don't think you would see it. I think you'd only see it from this vantage point and then probably the other one from City Hall looking down. Mm. And in which case, I think from the City Hall one, you started losing the, the ground floor. Um, doesn't really come in that clearly because it's kind of down the hill. Mm. Um, just kind of just some considerations that we've kind of looked at. Yeah. So um, just in the color, Jill, you had had one image in your presentation that had the palette um, with the materials and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I think these are, this is a really um, very pleasing combination of, I think very Victorian-ish colors um, that I think pull, helps pull this building into the context. Um, so I, I'm assuming that the warm gray uh, brick is mm -hmm. what would be on the bottom. So, right and in the mid middle section is the is oh the oh sorry this the gray yes is at the bottom yeah. correct yeah. so it's not quite as white as what's it's not white popping. Right. correct correct um, so I think this yeah this looks more um, I think it's more glowing and then the top would be this kind of putty color correct yeah which is more reflective of what city hall looks like, except it's clean. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't have as much trouble with the colors as um, Michael and Barbara do. Um, and I, I just think it's gonna be such an incredible improvement to this area, which has been so sore looking for so long. Um, I, I just, yeah, I, I don't really have any objections to any of it. Greg, are you there? And do you wanna comment? Yeah, the only question I had was parking behind City Hall. And uh, I think uh, when the drawings show that, that will not be changed. Um, yeah, it's pretty big yard, right? Yeah, it wouldn't be changed substantially. I, I think you do lose, like, maybe, Jill, you have a number offhand, but I think it was like two, two spots. Two, two, spots. two spots, yeah. 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 Okay. And did, did the city employees still get their reserve spaces back there? They, or hasn't they, that been worked out? <laughs> I don't know that it's totally assigned but the idea i think is river reserved yeah. spaces up by the, the city hall and then guest you know down by a municipal building uh, spaces. Uh, yeah. Yeah. but it does eliminate the currently there's sort of a blind corner when you come into the lot which is a little bit um a little bit dangerous so this yeah. gets rid of that which is uh you know a nice a nice change mm -hmm. uh, yeah okay um, so uh, the question then is just do, do any of us feel like we need to pass any of these comments on the MHC in a formal way, uh, or, um, would it be helpful, Bill and Jill, to have a letter of support from us? What would be, what's the best, um, uh, way to follow up on this? Um, Sarah, do you want to comment on kind of what, so basically uh, just to kind of give folks some context here, we, we did submit the PNF to a mass historic and they, they did ask for some additional information which we have already uh, one of the comments was you know basically just any commentary from the mass from uh, the local commission mm -hmm. um, you know whether i think i think if they support the pro you know supporting the project i think is a commentary that would you know meet the section 106 review um sarah i don't know if you have a 
the yeah, so th I, this was a little bit different than a typical Section 106 review because Mass Historic specifically asked for any comments from the Historical Commission. So we could reply that you know, we support it, it looks great. Um, but you know, typically it's a, do we comment or do we not? And it seems like they're specifically asking for something in this case. Yeah, I think um, uh -huh. when I, sorry, um, Chair, uh, Madam Chair, I, I just, I think when we sent it before, because uh, we did have the minutes that we actually had ready to send, but I, I think they actually specifically said this is not a section 106 review and this is an informal um, kind of review of the project in preparation for the zoning hearing. So I think, um, you know, having it more as like, you know, we responded to concerns of the geometry, uh, particularly on that north elevation um, and that, you know, we've, you know, ad address the considerations of the commission uh, mm -hmm. and we'll, you know, continue to work with the commission on, uh, especially the finishes, We're, we'll do an exhaustive effort on making sure that, you know, the, the building colors and the finishes utilized are um, in all agreement, um, you know. So I think maybe the minutes, I think, want to note, you know, um, kind of that that response aspect. And I think that should be sufficient if Sarah, if you would agree. Yeah. I think so. Okay. So um, we'll follow up with MHC, I guess. Um, let them know we're, we're basically in support in a few tweaks. And now it'd be, it'd be great to kind of at some point, if you could come back and give us an update on where you are with things. We always like to be updated. So that'd be great. Yeah, of course. And so I think. Once we get um kind of more closer to pricing and everything, I find, you know, we can select finishes now, but, you know, in a year or two years, the same finishes may be gone. And, you know, I think I don't want to say that things are going to change from from now, but I, I suspect that, um you know, well, before this gets underway in construction, there's going to be some changes that will allow us to go back into the commission. Okay, great. Good. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, we Good appreciate luck. the support of the commissioners and uh, everybody here this evening. Oh, well, you're we, welcome. We, we appreciate, we appreciate what, what you're doing. doing on this project. It's a fabulous project. Yeah, it's so great. I hate that staircase. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't live here when it was made, but oh, God. I say it's brutalism, and Sarah's like, it's not brutalism. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it, not on purpose, though, which is even worse. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about <laughs> the architecture. <laughs> It's horrible. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we have uh, just one other item on the agenda. It is after seven, but I do want to just briefly talk about this. This is the ap application that um, we've talked about making in the next round of community preservation funding, which is coming up in the fall. And um, we had discussed uh, making inventory to receive some money to proceed with the inventory, um, which is a strong, as we know tonight from our review of the 197 Elm, and we know nothing about that outbuilding, um, we're trying to correct that. We have a really long way to go, and I think we need to get started on it. So um, I did, I don't know if other folks have, have looked at the preservation plan. Um, there were several areas that, um, were designated as needing inventory. I think it's, um, I think I would turn to you, Sarah, uh, just because you're aware of um, kind of what the public concern is about these and where we may be able to kind of quell some other concerns um, for districts. But I also wanted to point out that there are three properties in here that are individual properties um, that were, uh, selected out as being critic in critical need of inventory. Um, these are all kind of on the outskirts of, um, kind of, two of them are really on the outskirts of the downtown. One is Prospect Heights, which is off of Jackson Street. And I guess I would be in favor of trying to do those. These are really beautiful old farm house, especially that once on the one on, um, North Farms Road and Autumn, the two on two that are on the outskirts, I think are lovely old um, farm properties. And um, it just seems like we should deal with those uh, in case someone comes along and buys them and wants to take them down. Um, so there's that. And then, then there are eight 
in the district uh, designation that are considered critical. And I don't know, sir, if you have any thoughts about those. Um, if one, yeah, I, I was thinking, I guess, of going with with what was identified as the most important for now, um, and trying right. to figure out if we can get prices for that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot of gaps. There's a lot of different ways we could approach it, but the consultants did identify some that were really critical. So starting with those, right. like the best way to go. Okay, so one of so one of the eight critical districts that were yeah. identified. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anybody? I, do you want me to? I can name the, what those are, and if anybody feels strongly about one or the other, um, at, um, there's Allen Street, Gothic Street, which is downtown, Bay State Village, the industrial part of it, uh, the Florence Center business area, which is important, but remember, we also have a National Register uh, nomination going on for uh, the adjacent part of Florence. So we may wanna con not consider that right now. Laurel Park, which is the um, camp that's out at the end, uh, uh, out on Route 5. Uh, Leeds Center, North Farms Road, North Farms, the Oxbow and West Farms. So if anybody has any strong feeling about one or the other of those, I know there's been a lot of concern about um, Bay State, I know, but that, I think that's mostly the residential area, right, Sarah? And that wasn't considered critical at this point. Yeah, for, for the most part. Um, and I I think Laurel Park might be a a great one to start with. We are see, starting to see some demolition applications for houses in Laurel Park. Um, okay. It's it is the ones in in the worst condition at at this point. Um, maybe ones that were converted from outbuildings or or other. Uh, yep, I remember. But yeah. we also don't know that for sure, like because we didn't. Someone will say, "Oh, this you know this was a conversion. It used to be, it used to be a different use." But we don't have the documentation to be able to look at that. Um, and Laurel okay. Park is definitely one that would. Be, uh, eligible for national register listing. Okay. So, so in, yeah, go ahead, Michael. So in in asking for uh, CPA funding, um, I, I I like the idea of Laurel Park. My question about Laurel Park is only, are there other ways to get that work done? And I the reason that I raised that is because you have a very motivated um, community there. Um, it seems like the kind of place that could be a great project for someone that is doing graduate work. Um, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, if, if we're thinking about funding and how it gets allocated, that's one that seems to me that holds together as being especially captivating to be done in other kinds of creative ways that might not require as much funding, or there may be a way that the proposal is made so that the funding somehow um, leverages that kind of work. So if it could be used to sort of subsidize a, a graduate student research project or community historical, research, you know, I'm just putting that out there in that way, because it seems to me like a, a really good project for getting some other kinds of um, human resources brought to bear. That's a really good point. Um, Sarah, in in your estimation, and I, I can't, I can't as a CPA member, CPC member, I can't really uh, weigh on this. I don't think. But yeah, you can. Uh, so you're just, you know, you don't have any, um, you, you don't have a conflict be just because you're a member of another board. Um, so no, but yeah, well, I guess my question is, do we, do you think for the application we would need to state we're going to inventory this area, or do you think we could apply for funding to Oh, uh, for, for various areas, and then we decide once we get the funding exactly how it gets yeah. used. Uh, yeah, and we could try it. Um, I mean, I know the Community <laughs> Preservation Committee, and you, of course, do as well, Martha, is really careful about expenditures of funds and um, knowing all the details of things. So there is a chance that they may ask, and we might not know at yeah. that point. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if we elaborate on those critical areas, there's not that many of them. It, that, that could be a possibility. I mean, we could propose you know, a few or, you know, a few and just say we're trying, we're trying to make a final decision about this. I mean, they're all in the preservation plan. So I don't know. Um, I'd, I'd certainly want to link the application to the 
preservation plan and say that these are the ones that were identified and just partly depending on the funding and and then Sarah what if you get a a quote for what it would cost we might have a better idea of how much we could do with that mm -hmm. yeah yeah we could definitely go that route and and leave it open ended because okay. i would think we'd need to be somewhat specific yeah well that's what i'm thinking barbara i don't know i and, and you know i suppose we could um we could try it being a little more open um and then if the committee comes back and said you need to be more specific we, we could reapply in the second round but um or we could make the decision at that point if the, the committee says hey we want to know exactly which one of these areas are going to be inventorying mm -hmm. um i think it's fine to go with the idea of saying the preservation plan we identified areas of critical need that's what the funding would be used for to the extent mm -hmm. that we get the funding to the extent that we get a sense of what the costs are going to be to get the work done um we then decide how it gets used but i mean all of these areas are seem I, I would say with the exception of Florence Center, you know, they all seem to be critical mm -hmm. at this moment. So, sure. And yeah, it's and also an, an infinitely scalable project. You know, if the, the CPC decided, well, you know, we only have $10,000 at this point, we we could do something with $10,000. It wouldn't be a whole lot of form Bs, but it would be some. Um, right. But if they were to allocate a, a larger grant, then we could go a lot farther with them. Yeah, I'm thinking of the, you know, the community um, CPHC has funded gravestone conservation in the cemeteries, um, you know, large gravestone conservation projects, and they don't ask to see which stones are actually being conserved. Mm -hmm. So they were just, you know, identified in a preservation plan for the cemetery. So that was enough. Yeah, that's um, true. And it's not being done in a vacuum, and it is part of an approved um, right. plan. And it's, the need is tremendous. Okay, so should we approach it that way and see where we get with how we get with it, and and then we'll make a decision as a committee or com commission um, once if the funding comes through and how much what the best route for it is. It sounds good. Okay, and Sarah, I can work with you on getting um, an idea about um, pricing. Okay, that would that would be great. I think that would be the most challenging piece. Performance. Okay, sounds good. Okay, great. Good. Um, that is it for tonight. Does anybody have any other business they want to do? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm still working. I have a historical, I mean, a historic Northampton meeting tomorrow night. They seem to come in the same week, Monday and Tuesday, and I'm pressing oh, them well. to try and find a replacement for me. Yeah, I know. You're so hanging we'll in there. We appreciate it so much. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. I know you need a break. I, I do. I've decided I really do. Yeah. Well, you're so <laughs> it's fine. I'm fine to continue till, till okay. they come up with something. Good. All right. Well, if there's no other business, we will adjourn and um, we're meeting on the 30th, which is good. That gives them a little more time and I hope they can, I don't know. Um, I think it's important that we, you know, we uh, it request these applicants um, for, projects like this one that's being proposed on, um, you know, they need to really do a detailed application. Um, feel pretty strongly about that. So I'm glad that people concurred. Okay. I can okay. understand with uh, the neighbors right there when I, it seems like there's a street over there that you're going to see it more than from Elm Street, but <clears throat> I understand the neighbor's concerns and to have them online here uh, was kind of beneficial. Yeah. yeah, I think, um, yes, I think that that's really true. And I, I do think they're probably worried about the sound of the mechanicals. And, um, you know, as I said in the meeting that earlier, that um, that's what came up at the state hospital park we did. Right. And we had mm -hmm. to close all the mechanicals because the neighbors were concerned about the noise. Um, yeah. So I'm just surprised they want to keep the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that's a business. Okay. So that's, so, that's um, why I said as a former pool owner, I certainly yeah. understand the literal <laughs> so pool. My, my God, brother once nothing, nothing worse than having my a brother pool. once had a pool, one of his houses where he lived, and he said 
the happiest days in the lives of a pool owner is the day they like open it and first have it. And then the day they just get rid of it. <laughs> Fill it in. Yeah. And... yeah. yeah. All well, right. it's funny because so, I grew up in Western New York and everybody, there's so many houses out there have swimming pools because there's okay. no, you know, um, there are lakes and that kind of thing, but it's not, um, this is very popular and it's very popular mm -hmm. in the middle of the country too. Just, mm -hmm. yeah, you see, if you fly over, you see a lot of swimming pools. So anyway, okay. Well, so everyone have a good month. Michael, have a good time in Scotland. Thank you. And um, we will see you in a month. <laughs>